Hi, is this Joey? Yeah, this is Joey. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a singer, songwriter, and the last surviving member of the group Badfinger. He just came out with a brand new album in October, Be True to Yourself. And we are very excited to welcome the one and only Mr. Joey Mullen to the show. You're on with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you very much, Whitney. Lovely. You know, I've been thinking about getting dental implants, and I'm kind of scared. And I understand you had that done yesterday. Yeah, I had it done on Wednesday. And, uh, yeah, I, un- I, I underestimate it. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, the side effects of it. Um, oh, it was brutal. It was like they beat me up. Um I'm, uh, I'm, I'm all my face is bruised and my chin and stuff. It's really kind of a uh, horrible experience. Wow. But uh, it's, it's getting better now and I can talk again. And uh, I know it's going to look a lot better than it did. You know, I've had English teeth all my life. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> English, English teeth are notorious for wearing out quickly. Yeah. And so mine had, uh, but I'm released, so I had them fixed by a good old American surgeon's. And uh, I feel good now. Feel well, good now you won't be able to get a part in a new Austin Powers movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's I did not mean this last one either. Yeah, <laughs> but I was wondering, you know, when you have something like that, okay, your gift is your voice. Uh, are you worried that something like that may change the way you sound? Um, no, not not in particular. You know, I've had some. Uh, I've had some teeth work done in the past, and that didn't really alter it. So I'm not really bothered, you know. Then it'll be all right. You know? Well, hopefully your dentist was a Joey Mullen fan. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> well, he was, wasn't he? Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course he was. Well, I must say, there's a definite connection between us because one of my really good buddies is uh, Brett Hudson, and Brett Hudson got a hold of me and was like. Would you like to talk to Joey? I'm like, hell yeah. You know, so. <laughs> That's really nice of you to say that. <laughs> and he turned around and told me, because uh, he arranged uh, for us to get the tracks, and we got the tracks sent to us by Mark, of course, who's the producer of your album. And Brett that's told right. me. Huh? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, and, and uh, Brett told me, he said, now you make sure you listen to the entire album because it's really good. And, you know, I was very impressed. I mean, age hasn't changed you at all. You sound really great, and I can I can hear the old you, and definitely a lot of influences. As far as the sound of the album, the one thing that everybody always wonders about whenever an artist has been around for a while, brings out a new yeah. album, it's how different is it from the old Joey Mullen? How would you explain the sound is compared to what people used to hearing you do? How would I explain it? Yeah. I think it sounds. Uh, I think it sounds very modern. Uh, I mean, the style of music that I do. Uh, I don't know. You know, I've been doing it all my life, so I guess it's it's old music. But uh, but the sound of the record isn't old. Mm-hmm. Uh, the performance on the record isn't old. Uh, the energy on the record isn't old. It's all brand new. And so uh, I, I'm really quite excited about the sound. And what people are saying about it, you know. Right. Um, and the songs turned out really good. Uh, the, the people that played with us, all the musicians, it was all done live. Uh, uh, you know, we obviously we did vocal overdubs and all that stuff, all the moves and ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all the back tracks were done in one take, uh, you know, and all of that stuff. Now um, we're talking about so, something that was done in a studio compared to doing something in a home studio with a computer, right? That's exactly right. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was done at Mission Sound in New York. Uh, brilliant genius engineer, Mario McNulty, he's a Grammy winner. He's done bunches of great records, great CDs, uh, David Bowie, among others. Um, it's a great old studio. Uh, they got a room full of drunkards there and a room full of amplifiers. Yeah, wow. Yeah, wow. Or oh, every keyboard, every keyboard you'd want to look at, in terms of a, you know, a real keyboard like a piano, a, a B3, you know, or a Hammond B3 organ, uh, all of them, all of them, there was wonderful. Well, I know Mark Hudson's involved and and is your producer. Now you met him quite a few years ago at a, a Beatles uh, tribute concert uh, event, right? 
That's right, yeah, Pete LaFence. Uh, he, he did a lot of work with Ringo during his career, you know, produced a bunch of Ringo albums and uh, played in Ringo's band, The Roundheads. Uh, so he had a real solid connection to the Beatles. Yeah. And, of course, I did all that work with them as well uh, in the old days. So, yeah, yeah. So how did the, uh, take us through the genesis of the album. I mean, how did the idea to, I know you had met Mark at the at the Beatles event, but how did the idea to come about for you guys to get together and do this album? Well, it took me 10 years, but I talked him into it. <laughs> 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 no, I really wanted to make a new record, and I have done for a while, but... Um, you know, I, I'm not a real, a real record producer. I can make a record, make it sound okay, but uh, I wanted to work with a real producer, and that's exactly what Mark is. Uh, and the more we worked together, the more I thought it'd be great if he'd produce me a record. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I talked to him, talked to him, talked to him, and uh, eventually he called me one day. I guess he had a few, uh, you know, we had a bit of time off or something, and... Uh, you know, he said to me, hey, what about that record? And I, I, you know, I freaked out and uh, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sent him, like, 40 songs that I had sitting in the bag. And uh, that was the start of it. And from that came these 10 songs and, and the album here. Right. It took about, really about three years uh, to actually do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after we actually got down to the, to the actual doing of it. Uh, he lives in New York and Los Angeles. I live in Minnesota. As a musician, he's lived all over the place. Uh, we were lucky to get a really good rhythm bed uh, from bass players and, uh, uh, in New York City, guitar players. And uh, Steve Holly came and played drums for us. Uh, just, uh, just really great. Mark played some as well. Yeah. And also, uh, you mentioned Steve Holly, uh, also yeah. Jason Sheff. Uh, Julian Lennon and somebody, of course, Julian Lennon, you know, legendary son of John Lennon, uh, somebody you got to work yeah. with that you had actually toured with for a Beatles tribute concert, and that was you had Mickey Dolan's help you out. That's right, yeah, yeah. Well, we did that, uh, did that tour last year because it was like 50 years of the White Album, mm -hmm. uh, or 50 years ago today the tour was called. And it was it was based on the White Album, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did that, uh, Todd Runkin, Ricky Dolans, Jason Sheff, Christopher Cross, and myself. Uh, we did, yeah, did about 40 dates, 50 dates last year. Uh, we want to do more this year, actually. It was, it was a lot of fun, I think, for everybody. And uh, we sold a lot of places out, so everybody's very happy with it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, uh, but because of the COVID, of course, all that's been cancelled. Right. But we did become uh, very good friends on the tour. And uh, when they found out I was doing a... Uh, a uh, new record, and they kind of volunteered uh, to come and sing with us on it. Wow. So, uh, I said, well, of course, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. You know, I was knock up, knock up. But were you, were you ever a fan of the Monkees or the Hudson Brothers? Well, sure I was. Sure I was yeah. a fan of the Monkees. The Hudson Brothers were out, really, before I came, I came to America. Uh, so I didn't really see them in, in, in that uh, light. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've known Mark for a long, long while, and if the Hudson Brothers were anything like that, uh, that would be a crazy show. Right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, they're very supportive, and I, I think it was so cool that Brett was really supporting his brother's work as a producer. I mean, you know, you got a great team behind you, and that definitely helps. And I guess Julian Lennon is a photographer and even shot the artwork for the cover. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of his, that's one of his careers, huh? Asset it is, and uh, yeah, he had he had these photographs. Mark saw saw one, uh, the front cover, mm -hmm. uh, and, and he really liked it. And he suggested to me, he said, you know, maybe we could talk to uh, uh, Julian about using his photo for the cover. And I said, well, it looks it looks like a great cover, mm -hmm. uh, so he did. Uh, Mark had a word with him, and uh, he gave us permission for us to use it, and uh, we're very grateful. And then he gave us uh, the. You know, another one to the back. Pretty similar, but a little different to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're really, really lucky. I'm really lucky. I like really. I mean, being you around... Know, around, around is, just incredible. Right. Being around as long as you have and, and having all that connection, of course, with Apple Records and with the Beatles and everything, did you get into uh, any conversations with Julian about his dad? 
No, no, it's something, uh, it's something I've never really talked to him about, really, you know. Uh, I did work with this guy a, a little bit on the Imagine album, but no, I haven't, no, I haven't really got into that kind of conversation with him, no. Well, you know, since we're kind of talking about uh, the Beatles, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your interaction and your experiences, because you worked with both John and George, but from what I read online, you worked a little bit more closely with George. Can you talk about both gentlemen from the Beatles and, and what it was like working with them, especially when, you know, you were yeah. kind of just up and coming at the time, right? Yeah, we were, I was, you know, I was about 23 then, yeah? And mm -hmm. I just joined the band. I just joined Bad Finger. And uh, we had a couple of hits. Uh, and one day, George just called us up and asked us if we'd come bring our guitars to the studio. Uh, he was making a new record, and he asked us, well, did we want to come down and play? And we, and we went down there, and there they all were, man. And that was my first real experience of being around the Beatles. I'd seen them a raffle at the offices and stuff, but never really socialized with them, you know. Uh, I was a huge Beatle fan, and just to be random was really kind of freaky, mm -hmm. you know? Right. I don't know what you guys, I don't know what you guys are like with these big stars, but I get kind of nervous about oh, yeah. it. <laughs> we, we do, we yeah. do. And I think yeah, it's, I think know, it's great. You know, that, you know that feeling, yeah. So I go in the studio and there's Ringo Starr sitting there playing the drums. Uh, Edward Clapton is the... Uh, Klaus Foreman, the bass player, uh, Billy Preston, and George Harrison, wow. all in the room together. And we're walking in with our guitars, and boy, it was super. Everybody was really nice, shouting hello and all that. And, uh, hey, it's bad thing, guy. And then, um, and George came over to start talking to us and thanking us for coming and everything. Uh, and it was a wonderful, really social experience, as well as great working on the music. It was lovely. Uh, everybody was super nice. Uh, there were no big stars in the room, even though all these big stars were in the room, you know. They all seemed like normal people. And uh, they made us feel very at home, and uh, that made the job a lot easier, you know. And I understand uh, I understand that, that George Harrison, as far as producing and kind of directing everybody, he was a little bit more direct and more blunt than John, right? Well, he was, he was, he was a lot more kind of formal in that way he had all his arrangements all set uh, he knew what he wanted us to do um, but it wasn't that different experience don't get me wrong uh, they'd, they'd both been recording with the Beatles mm -hmm. all those years you know uh, and so that's how they recorded uh, they liked to record with everybody in the same room uh, they liked everybody to play at once um, and all that they liked to get that rhythm bed all together at the same time, you know. So um, they were very similar in that way. John was a bit more forthright, uh, more kind of a uh, Liverpool way of talking. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. He, he, you know, he used language and uh, uh, he talked the way he wanted to. He, um, we're going to do this. Uh, the song's <laughs> called Jealous Guy. You know what I mean? And it uh, goes like this, and and he'd sing it to you. And all of a sudden, it was John Lennon there playing the guitar and singing to you, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Uh, which is an unbelievable experience. Uh, and just incredible. Uh, you know, he made jokes with the drummer about the drum bits and uh, the bad thing of fellas. When we finished Jealous Guy, he said, uh, you can, you know, he, he didn't, well, I, shouldn't, I can't even say what he said because he swore on Should No, you, told, can, you can say we're uncensored. Go ahead. <laughs> he, he, he said, uh, he said, you can fuck off now if you like. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we said, no, 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 it's okay. We'll hang about for a bit because he just wanted us to play on Jealous Guy. Really. Right. But he was, he was going to do I Don't Want to Be a Soldier next. Right. And so we just jammed along with, along with it. It was like a Bo Diddley kind of rhythm thing. It was nice. And uh, anyway, don't you know that they're the guitars that he used? The bad thing it did on the back of it. Oh, really? They were the ones on I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. Yeah, that's what he gave us credit for. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so it's, not, you know, it's, kind of, it's kind of bizarre that that happened, but uh, what a great time. Just like you'd imagine, uh, you know, going around his house was really interesting. Uh, 
there was nobody there when we got there we walked in the front door and <laughs> Uh, you know, so it was really kind of weird. All black carpet everywhere. Black really? Carpet. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, completely black as well. Not not patterned or anything. It's black. Wow. And uh, the room with the big white piano, you know. Uh huh. Uh, the front pile, nothing else in the room, really. Just piano. Uh, huge room, but anyway, we walked through his house, billiard room and all that. Beautiful old Indian billiard table. He had frames on the walls with uh, tools in them, you know, like a hammer. Really? Uh, or wow. Yeah, like paint, painting frames, I mean, like art frames. Yeah, yeah. And he had like a shovel hung up there and a chisel, uh, you know, different tools with the, with the works of art that he had hanging up. And um, the jukebox in the kitchen, all the old hit records. Fantastic. Just like you'd imagine Johnny's house, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like in, in comparing yeah. the different boys of, of the Beatles and how they were and how they reacted, I don't know how much interaction you had with Paul when it came to producing or them basically telling you what to do because, of course, you were on Apple Records. Uh, another yeah, uh, yeah. person, another performer from Apple Records, uh, we had on the show an interview who was Mary Hopkin. Uh, who did those oh, were yeah. the days uh, she didn't yeah. like Paul's interaction she said that he kind of took over her songs and kind of didn't give her the creative freedom that she wanted to have D did you have any input from any of the Beatles or Paul particularly to where they were over influencing you we, 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 did, we did with George uh, when we were doing the George thing and of course we gave them the straight up album and they uh, they didn't like that uh, the one we recorded, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had us do a whole new album, and George came on board and produced it. So they did in that sense. And George, uh, when we were doing uh, the songs, he was, and you know, I didn't realize this at the time, that, but they were very concerned with making hit records. Yeah. Mm, you know. Yeah. And selling records. They, you know, they, they were concerned with that. And the Beatles were masters of writing hit songs. You know, they didn't do all the songs they wrote. They did the ones that were going to be hits. Yeah. Right, you know? right, right. And they, they were brilliant at it. And so they were naturally concerned with that stuff. And I'm sure I didn't... <clears throat> I wasn't there for the Paul sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, I'm a little bit broken here. That's okay. But uh, I wasn't there for the, the Paul sessions. But I was there for all the George stuff and, and the John stuff, uh, of course. But yeah, yeah, they, they do uh, they do influence how you write your songs and what you write, yeah. And what they're trying to do is make you hit records. Yeah. Right. So, well, yeah. And I had, do. I had read that at one point, George had, and I guess he asked, he didn't just tell you, but he asked if he could play Slide on a Badfinger song, right? Oh, yeah, he came. And <laughs> <laughs> we were, we'd, done, we'd done day after day, and we were, we were about to do the solo, and Pete and I were working out the Slide solo. Uh, we both played slide ourselves. Anyway, we were working on it, and then George came in, and he, uh, he just came in and asked, could he play slide? And uh, and I think he, he was just missing playing the guitar. He right. loves to play the guitar. So, uh, you know, it took a long time to do his own album, that all things were fast. Uh, and he, he wasn't playing with anybody. He never played with anybody except the Beatles, you know? Right. So... Well, I mean, he, was, he, he, he loved it. Took, he, it took ages. To he do probably it. figured that nobody was going to look at George Harrison and be like, "No, you're not going to play with us. Sit in the corner." <laughs> he, well, you would think you would think he would be like that, but he was. He was very, very normal about it. Mm -hmm. When he said, "Do you mind?" I think he meant it. Huh? You know what I mean? He wanted to know if we wanted to play. It was our record, mm -hmm. right? And uh, but he but he did only do it that one time. He did only come and play. Uh, but he actually took well, I gave him my scrap and said, "Here, go ahead, play that." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah. were you were involved anyway, with he, the. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, he, he did great, man. They they, they worked. Uh, you know, he took as long as I don't know three four hours over that solo. Wow. Uh, working on it, he made sure that uh, both the slide parts. He wanted to do them both at the same time. You know, yeah. if there were going to be two slide parts. He wanted to do them both at the same time. And they were playing in unison on slide. And I don't know if you play slide, but it's difficult to play in unison. Right. 
uh, on slide, you know. Yeah. But uh, he did it, and Pete did it, and it worked out great. It sounded beautiful, still does. So. But you did the whole so Bangladesh that. thing with, with George, too, right? Yeah, yeah. But he called us up. He was going to do his own record, you know, the All Things You Must Pass record. And uh, he invited all the people who played on it, uh, people who came and sang on it and stuff. He invited all those same people to come, and they did. Yeah. Incredible. We wow. had we had Billy Preston down there, and, but I tell you what, to see there was Billy was doing that's the way God's planned it uh, at the at the concert, the Bangladesh concert, and he's singing a song and playing it away, just playing his heart out. We're all we're all playing along, we're just really enjoying it, and all of a sudden he's off the uh, organ and he comes dancing across the stage towards us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're sitting there with our acoustic guitars going. Oh, what's going to happen now? You know, wow. <laughs> was cool. he, he stopped himself and came around and spooted right back. But man, uh, just great to see it. See, see it all going on. Leon Russell right here playing the piano and the horn section. Incredible. Uh, it, was, it was just, yeah, it was incredible. It was lovely. Billy okay. Preston was, was so great. I mean, I'm a big fan. I don't really think in, in America we really knew who he was until he had his pop single, Will It Go Round in Circles, but he, he was iconic. Yeah, he was. He was in, like, uh, um, what's the St. Louis Blues movie? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he played, he played I think, W.C. Handy when he was a kid. Yeah. He played that in that movie. That's how much experience that guy had. I had no idea about that. Wow. Played with everybody. He played with Little Richard. Uh, I think he played with Ray Charles. Uh, he played with loads and loads of people. And of course, he was the fifth Beatle, you know. Right. <laughs> when they met him, they had him play on everything, you know. So, yeah, he was great, man. A well, beautiful guy. I really uh, guy. enjoyed finding out. I wasn't really aware at the time, and I, I should have been. Uh, sometimes, you know, it takes me a while to get to see a movie. His movies been around for a while but i just recently saw and fell in love because i'm a peter sellers fan the magic christian oh yeah and you did yeah, the music yeah. for the magic christian right yeah that thing it did uh, the guys um uh, when paul brought them to the come and get it song uh, and then he produced it for them and he asked them to write a song for the introduction to the movie uh which is that bit where ringo's sleeping in the park uh-huh mm -hmm. yes and they, and they did. They wrote a song called Carry On Till Tomorrow. And Paul liked it so much. It was so so right for the movie that he gave them the uh, opportunity to write the rest of the music, which is two more songs. Uh, one called Crimson Ship uh, and another called uh, Rock of Ages. So they had four songs in the movie from that. Yeah, it was great. Absolutely incredible. Well, when you turn around, you became a member of Badfinger. Now, they were under another name at the time, and they were outing one of the members, and they brought you in, right? Yeah, yeah. For some reason, uh, the bass player left the band, uh, and Tommy Evans decided he was going to uh, play bass. So they started talking for a guitar player, and a good friend of mine uh, recommended me for the job. Um, so... I went down an audition and I got the job in the band, yeah. 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 And you weren't initially even going to audition, right? Yeah, I auditioned for it, yeah. yeah. They had a bunch of people do it, so I went down and did it. I was a bit a bit worried about it, really, but uh, I like rock and roll music, and the, the Ivies weren't known to me as a rock band, you know. Uh, they were very poppy in their, in their early days. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it turned out they wanted to be more of a rock band. And they had been when they were, before they'd left Swansea, their hometown, they were well known around the town as a rock band. Uh, oh. And a big group. But, but when they started writing songs, uh, and I don't know, this seems to happen to everybody, you start writing songs like love songs, about mm -hmm. everything's about love. And so, uh, and there's, not, there's really nothing wrong with that, but it's very poppy, very lightweight music. Right. And they wanted, to, they wanted to rock out some, you know. Uh, well, so, I, I think the name uh, Badfinger definitely sounds more rock than the Ivies. The Ivies <laughs> sounds like some 50s doo-wop music or something, you know? That's right. And, and you know, there was another band in England called uh, the Ivies. Yeah. Uh, uh, which, you know, they were they were a pop band too. 
Um, and then they wanted to avoid the confusion, but most of all, they wanted to get more rock and, you know, to people to give them a bit of a chance at that, you know. Uh, and it worked out good. It worked out good. Well, the way you described Badfinger, I thought was very interesting and thought maybe you could tell people what that meant. You said that Badfinger was a perfect example of what you call rock socialism. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I meant by the way we governed it, but uh, the, the name Badfinger came from uh, the Beatles demo for, with a little help from my friend, and it came because John Lennon played the piano, hmm. and the, uh, he wasn't the greatest pianist in the world, he could play, but he wasn't the greatest, and I think he made some mistakes, so they called it Badfinger Boobie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the name of it was. And it was Neil Aspinall who uh, who treated us, to, who, who suggested it for a name. Neil Aspinall, of course, is the Beatle Roadie. Right. Well, there you yeah. go, absolutely. So, so, did you get that? Yes, yes. So, go ahead. Did you want me to give you that bad thing or was it associate spend? <laughs> well, you had mentioned in another interview that we had read that uh, Badfinger was a perfect example of rock socialism. Uh, I guess it probably <laughs> goes back to the fact that, uh, I mean, Badfinger as a, as a band, you guys were like a family and all of that was good, but then, of course, money got in the way, right? Money, well, money always gets in the way of rock bands. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I wasn't talking about it like that. It was, we had our agreements in... in uh, in Badfinger, and when I joined them, they already had made an agreement to share uh, any songwriting royalties they make. Mm -hmm. And uh, the deal was this, uh, was the songwriter, and it was only for songs that Badfinger recorded. Right. Uh, or the Ivies actually as well. Uh, they're only for the songs that they recorded. And uh, the songwriter would get the first kind of 25 cents off the dollar. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. The, the other 75 cents was split equally amongst the five partners, mm -hmm. including the songwriter. So, songwriter ended up getting 40% of the money. Right. 40% of the dollar. And the other guys got 15 cents each. Right. And that was that was the agreement how we did with our royalties. All the... Uh, all the expenses, we all paid our 20% of it. Uh, all the, uh, you know, everything else, we, we split yeah. equally. Most of the band, and we, we paid all the bills out, out of it first, out of the money first. Uh, so that sounds pretty socialist to me. Yeah. Uh, we, all got a, we all got our share, and, uh, you know, it was good because, um, like, I wrote half of the music in that band. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though I didn't write the big hits, half of each one of those albums, I wrote it. Right. And uh, so it made as much money as anybody else's song, you know? So it all worked out, you know? Well, it wasn't like I was, get, I was getting all the money. It wasn't like Tommy was getting all the money, or Pete was getting all the money, or yeah. Mike was getting all the money. Right. We all got paid what we made. Well, right. I, I know you're a positive person, and you like to, to be positive. But we got to mention, too, that Badfinger had a lot of bad luck. And from what I understand, what started the whole thing was uh, the, the fact that management was taking all your money. And was it not a situation that the one member had, uh, you tried to tell the one member that, that they were taking your money and he didn't believe you at first, right? No, he didn't believe us at all. Uh, and uh, Actually, he left the band. He was so... Uh, confirmed about it but of course he was wrong you know uh, it turned out really bad for everybody yeah. especially uh, Pete and Tommy uh, but the guy was a thief yeah. uh, he spent all of the money not some of it not some of it now but all of it wow, and this is your personal manager right yeah he was our, well he was our business manager uh -huh. uh, our, pers our actual personal manager Bill Collins was just as duped as all of us and uh, he ended up broke as well. Right. You know, we, we were all we were all broke, man. I mean, you know, I I got a job uh, laying coupe, laying rugs mm -hmm. uh, to make money. Uh, uh, you know, when I left the band in, in 
it's winter of 74 right around Christmas it was uh, I had $700 wow uh, and I had uh, my guitars were gone uh, all my equipment had been sold the, uh, the, the even the truck that we bought as a band had been sold um, it was a bloody nightmare man uh, how long was this go how long was this going was, on that he was taking your money like that? Uh, well, we were, he was doing it all the time, apparently. But he, fa he, um, we found out because Warner's found out that he'd gotten into the escrow account uh -huh. at Warner Brothers, and I don't know, nobody knows how he did this, but he actually stole money out of the accounts. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, when we delivered an album to Warner. Uh, they would pay us an advance on that album. Right. right. I know, but all those advances were put into an escrow account when we signed the deal. Sure. Yeah? So they were paid out through. So Polly found his way into the escrow accounts and got the money out. And Warners took our new record, Wish You Were Here, which is really doing quite well. It's going to go into charts. Uh, they took the record off the show. Uh, they Spended our record deal, and they sued us for the money that was missing. Uh -oh. Wow. Yeah, they, they, they couldn't go after the manager, Polly, uh, because uh, we signed the contract. Yeah. He hadn't signed the contract. We signed. So they sued us. And uh, you know what? They sent us a message to London. They wanted us to know that as soon as this mess was sorted out, uh, the deal would be reinstated and that single would be able to carry on with their record. Right. <laughs> I think that even we're going to re-release the album. Right. But, uh, um, just through, well, through circumstances, my wife got that message and she po called me at the meeting we were at and told me. I said, thanks very much, Kat. And I hung up and I turned around. I told the band that Warner's had telexed us to their office in London and had called my house to tell us that the deal was okay, we were going to be all right. Mm. But they had to sort out the money stuff. Right. There was $325,000 wow. missing or something. Anyway, uh, he got off and said he didn't want my wife managing the band and uh, he left the band. Oh. That's, how, that's how adamant he was about Polly being cool. Uh, so he left the band and we got a pianist Bob Jackson he came in and played we had a tour we were going to do in a few weeks crying out loud mm -hmm. uh, so you can see how the situation is here it, it, the, the money situation was, was bad but what's even worse is, is it led to a suicide right well yeah well six months later yeah Peter was Peter's wife was having a baby and he called up thinking he'd be able to get money from the manager. The manager said, oh, there's no money. You haven't got any money left. Yeah. Wow. He wanted to buy his, his wife uh, some, you know, stuff. To, she was going in the hospital to have the baby. Right. Yeah. And he wanted, to, you know, he wanted to buy her some, you know, nightgowns and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't even get the money to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I can get past the subject, and then later on there was a situation where you had another member that committed suicide, is that right? Yeah. Tommy was, uh, well, I don't really know why Tommy did it. I can't tell you the truth about that, yeah. really. I mean, I don't know the truth about it. I know he called me when he was going to do it. He called me that night. Yeah, he told you, he you, told didn't, me. you didn't believe him, right? Well, I, I didn't think he would go out and kill himself, no. Who would? Who would believe that? You know, nobody would believe and that. And I asked him, I asked him why he was telling me that. Why are you telling me that? I was in America. He was in London. Mm. Why was he telling me that? Hmm. He was really angry about the money in London. The money in court. But we couldn't get the money. I wanted the money too. My God, I was... I was doing day jobs. I was working day jobs when he, he was doing that. I wanted the money too, man. We all needed it. Yeah. My God, Mike needed it. Yeah. And I tell you something. In reality, Tommy was getting money from ASCAP. He was getting the ASCAP royalty from the bank. Uh -huh. 
to let him go. You know, he was making money. So I, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I got you... ideas. You know, I got ideas about it, but I don't want to get into it, really, right, man. Right. Uh, right. They they say enough things about me without me telling the truth mm-hmm. to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, the, well, let me ask you because I know that there was somebody had put out a a, a bad finger biography, uh, a book not too long ago, uh, and, and you know you weren't crazy about the book. Have you ever considered writing the book yourself or having it come straight from you? Because there seems to be a lot of misinformation out there. Everybody thinks yeah, they know well, what the, happened. The thing is. Uh I did put a book out. It was uh, an interview I did uh, with a um, you know a journalist, mm-hmm. uh, Mike Tamino on the East Coast, mm-hmm. and uh, we put that book up. And that just tells you your bare naked story. It's not uh, it's not me bitching about everything. Right. I just told them what happened in the band, what the band was doing. Uh, so I put that out. But you know, a lot of people in the in the Macavina book, which is the one you're talking about. I've, you know, I, I've never read the book. Um, my my wife read it. And, uh, it made her cry. It yeah. just made my wife cry. Uh, it was like the, uh, she and I were somehow responsible for all the bad things that happened, and they were responsible for all the good things that happened. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, you know, I, I don't. Do I want to write a book about that? Do I want to really write a book about that? You know, do I want those children to know about their fathers and all that? Yeah. Do I want true. everybody to know about them? Is it worth it? It's not worth it to me. Right. I know how it was. I was in the bank, you know? Right. You know, we ended up sorting out the money thing. And everybody gets all the money they deserve. Yeah. And all the money they earn. Peter Hans family gets all the money that he made. So does Tommy Evans' family, so does Mike Gibbons' family, and so does my family. Right. And so does Bill Collins, actually. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, well, you know, well, I'm not even going to go into it because it's not really something I want to uh, tell everybody about. Uh, well, you know, the, the whole I, thing that's I, the beautiful thing about it is, is that you're a survivor and you had it in you to continue on. What was it in your life that, that gave you that driving force to continue on? Because with all that tragedy that happened, most people would have quit. And here you are, a brand new album. What drives you? Well, I've been playing, you know, all these years. I love playing, man. I heard Elvis Presley when I was 11 years old. And some switch turned on inside me. Immediately, I'm not talking the next day or the next week. I'm talking that day. I went into the front parlor, my brother played the guitar, and I got his guitar out and started to learn to play. Yeah. Wow. Because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play the guitar. You know, the day before it, I was making, you know, bows and arrows. Uh, I was, you know, doing those kind of things, playing soccer. Um, the day after that, I was done. It was all, all gone. I was, I was playing the guitar, and that's what I did. Mm-hmm. Nice. And I've done that all my life. Uh, I've never really thought that I was going to be a rock star or anything, or never really dreamed about making a record, but I knew that I wanted to play the guitar, and re- I really enjoyed it. So I learned my Chuck Berry stuff and my Buddy Holly and, you know, all of that Eddie Cochran stuff. You know, all of them, all of them, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked hard at it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then I started getting jobs. People started asking me to play the guitar with them. Uh, which was like a miracle. Um, you got to work with great people like Todd Rundgren. I did. <laughs> I did, man. I've worked with Todd, yeah. It's funny you say that, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got to work with those guys. <laughs> I guess you've heard the stories about that, too. Uh, maybe. Why don't uh, you enlighten us? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. We're on well, Sunday. Uh, uh, well, I was going to say this. When we first met Matt Todd Rundgren, he, he was, uh, he was, well, frankly, he was an arsehole. Uh, he was rude, he was obnoxious, uh, he was egotistical, um, he thought he was the greatest guy in the world. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. He had yellow and green hair, um, 
we'd heard his records and they, and they were pretty good. I you know, I gotta say that. They weren't really our kind of music. Uh but it, you know, George had recommended him to come in and, and finish the production on the uh, Straight Up album, and uh, he came in, and we went along with the picture. He was, I mean, really obnoxious. He was rude to us. He told us we couldn't play. Mm. Uh, we were hopeless. Wow. Um, you know, we uh, and this was when we were, we recorded Baby Blue in like two takes. We overdubbed uh, the guitar solo and one acoustic. You know, mm -hmm. um, and that was our band playing live on that tape. You know, those drum tones are there. You know, those bass parts are on that tape. Uh, but this guy was saying things like that to us, and he seemed, he seemed frankly more concerned with the drum part for the song Triple Creek, the band song. Uh -huh. uh, it had that beautiful little drum right. kind of part in it, and he was, he was, he was obsessed with that. Uh, anyway, we liked it too, uh, but we were making a record and we made it. Uh, you know, I've got to go on to say, um, many years later, I met uh, Todd in the Hilton Bar in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. Played a show with him actually that night. Right. And uh, afterwards, I've been to have a glass of beer, and there was Todd Rumson. So I went up, I went up to him and said hello, and. Uh, you know, I said, listen, can you tell me? And I asked him why he was like that with us. Oh, you <laughs> did? Why, oh, okay. Why, why, why he was such an asshole to us. He said, oh, you just remember me like that, man. That's the, and that was his way out of that conversation. Wow. And, uh, so that was the end of that, really. <laughs> uh, you know, I went back to my beer. He went, he went to a drink. And we didn't we didn't fall out now in arguments about it, you know. Right. It was, it was probably good that he said something like that. Yeah. But I really wanted to know, I wanted to know if he had a reason, if it was some kind of tactic, if he thought it would spare us on, uh, or something like that. But it was, you know what, and, and I've heard over the years that he was like that with all, you know, a lot of the people mm. he worked with. Yeah. So it wasn't anything new for me to say it. I think somebody said it on the cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, see, you, you got just an opposite story because... I had a bad experience with Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry was an oh. asshole to me, but he was really nice wow. to you. <laughs> yeah, he was great to me. Yeah, he was lovely. So how'd you meet Chuck? It was through uh, Dick Clark, right? <clears throat> uh, no, no. I met him first time in San Francisco airport when I saw him. Mm. I was on a bad thing at all. <clears throat> and Tommy said, Joe, there's Chuck Berry over there. Oh. Chuck Berry is one of my absolute heroes, you know. Uh, so I went right over to him, and, and I, I called him Mr. Berry. Mr. Berry, uh, I just wanted to say hello, my name's Joey Mullen, uh, playing a band, band named Badfinger on there. Uh, you know, one of my heroes, I just wanted to say that to you. And he was really sweet. Uh, he said a few things, he was with a girl, and he didn't, you know, he, he didn't want to be stuck talking to me, but anyway, he was nice. I left. I saw him next time with uh, Dick Clark. Yeah. Mm. I went to the American Music Awards and I walked in and I heard this voice shouting me, Joey, Joey, Joey. And I turned around and there's Dick Clark, who was, who was a friend of ours, a great fan of the Bad Finger Band. And uh, he was standing there with Chuck Berry. <laughs> with, with Chuck Berry and he calls me over. And I'm going over there and there's Chuck Berry with him. And Dick's all smiling, great, you know. He's a great guy, I don't know if you ever met him. Anyway, he tells me, Joey, Joey, and he says, he turns around, and he, he, tell, he says to Chuck Berry, Chuck, you know Joey Mullen from Badfinger? <laughs> he didn't say, Joey, you know Chuck Berry. <laughs> 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 it, it, it really freaked me out like he expected Chuck Berry to know me. And uh, Chuck looked over at me, and he leaned over and rubbed his elbow on me. Oh, there you go. Which I, I took as a great compliment. It's you know? the, the touch from the master. <laughs> It's the master's yeah, touch. Man. Yeah, man. And so, uh, yeah, that's my real Chuck Berry story. I saw him one more time in my life. Uh, I went to see him at a casino out near Minnesota here. And uh, he was playing the show. I bought a record with me. Do you know the one with the profile of him? Uh -huh. yes. In front of it, the white, yeah. the white one. I bought that with me. And uh, I wanted to sign it for me. So, uh, and the agent got me tickets to the show. Went to the show. 
watch the show, it was incredible, and it was incredible. All the people dancing and ah. Anyway, uh, after the show, I go backstage with the agent, we go in the dressing room, Chuck signs me record, gives me a tip, uh, gives me a card, uh, uh, just some just little things, you know, and uh, again, he rubs his elbow on me, and uh, we took a photo. I've got a photo of me with Chuck Bet. Oh, wow. cool. And yeah. He, you know, he never took, he took a photo of me. And then uh, it was cool, he got his beer like the safer in the trunk of his Cadillac, and he was coming, you know? Yeah. Wow. It was great. One of the great nights in my life. And and what's great is you got to survive working with Phil Spector, and he didn't <laughs> shoot you or kill you. Or <laughs> didn't bring a gun with him as far as I knew. <laughs> Man. Wow. <laughs> the only time I really saw him, uh, Jordan knows, that was during the George Harrison sessions, right? Yeah. Right, uh, right. We went back in the, in the control room to listen to a tape of one of the songs. Uh and uh, Phil Spector was nowhere in sight. He was laying on the floor underneath the console with a bottle of Corvazier. Oh, my God. Uh, and he was chugging that and uh, shouting things from under the console. <laughs> uh, the track sounded great. You know, the, the recording and the little mix he had going for us sounded really, really good. <laughs> but he was just, he, re, he was just plastered, man. Uh, Some people work better when the they're drunk, you know. <laughs> drunk it makes it better sometimes. Uh, I used to think that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, mu <laughs> I, I must say, and I, I have to tell everybody because everybody thinks it's all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You were telling my daughter Tiffany when she talked to you on Friday. That, that you had painkillers, but you didn't want to take them because you didn't want to get hooked on the painkillers. <laughs> that didn't sound like a rock guy to me. I mean, you were like saying <laughs> no to the drugs. Well, you know, I read the instructions this time. In the old days, uh, you never had any instructions with the drugs that came <laughs> no. your way. You know, I never took any of the, uh, well, I never took any real heroin. Uh, and I not, certainly never injected any drugs into my body, man. Yeah. Uh, I had my periods, so I did my smoke, you know, and the, sure. the downers, the little buzzy pills and stuff. But uh, I'm not taking them now, and I won't take them anymore. Uh, I get out, you know, I take a half of one. Yeah. That's what, what I, I do, yeah. That's, exactly. That's what, they, that's what I've done this time, because I don't want to hurt, and this hurt like hell. Yeah. yeah. You know, I had four implants, and uh, a bunch of teeth taken out at the same time. Oof. You know? Cause I have, I'm getting work done on both, you know, upper and lower. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of intense, but, uh, you know, it's all good. It's all good okay. coming well, out of it. Nice coming you know, out. talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, bad finger, everybody talks about day after day, but I like without you, and then you covered Harry Nielsen. Uh, he was a great guy. I mean, was was he good to you? He was lovely to us. Uh, he came to see us. Uh, you know, we, we didn't know anything about him recording it or anything, and he asked us to, we were in uh, studios making a record ourselves. Um, I think the first Warner Brothers album. Anyway, uh, he came in and uh, he introduced himself like, I'm Harry Nielsen, you know. <laughs> and uh, we were like, oh, wow, you know, because we knew he was Harry Nielsen. He looked just like Harry Nielsen, there was a cap and all that. Right. You know, and those tree coat, you know. Uh, Anyway, he asked us to come and listen to a mix. Uh, he spent a long time doing the mix with the producer, Mr. Perry, and um, their ears were tired, and that's what happens when you mix in music. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a mix. You listen to the same song for hours on end. Yeah. So he asked us to come and have a listen and tell us if we liked it, uh, what we thought of it, and so we did. We went in, and uh, he pressed play, and the, the the song he played was, was without you. It was Harry Nielsen's version of Without You. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, it blew us away, completely blew us away. Uh, really ex ex extraordinary. Uh, we had no idea. No idea at all. I, I love that and thing he did with Ringo Starr, that, that movie. It was a son of Dracula or something. It, it was a little bizarre little movie, but it was really... Did you ever see that? No. 
No, I did. It's it's yeah. it's a trip. It's a trip. Well, this new album, we want to go back well, to talk I about. A, I had a question about the new album. Okay. So I mean, because that's good. That's what we're talking I about. I mean, now. knowing that it kind of came to fruition over like ten years or whatever. How exactly uh, did did you and Mark work on co-writing? I mean, I I know that you guys live in different places. So was it all like? Did you guys talk on the phone and write together? Was it all just you did some uh, and no, he did some, or? No, we really didn't. Uh, I went to New York. Um, he had he had some ideas from the CD or the music I'd sent him, mm -hmm. and they, w when we we met up at his apartment, uh, I was staying at his. He's got a couple of apartments. He has one with his wife and another one that he has his friends. Uh, we can stay at. So uh, we we were at, at that apartment and we just started working on the songs. Uh, he had some ideas. Uh, I had some ideas. Uh, sometimes it shocked me a little bit, you know, because uh, he changed something completely. Uh, but we just worked it. We just worked the songs, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm used to uh, producers always putting their two cents in yeah. uh, into, into my tunes. Uh, when we worked with Fat Finger, we worked on each other's tunes, and that's how we recorded them. Right. Uh, we made the parts up, made the guitar bits up, and the, you know, the U's and the R's and the, you know, all that. Uh, so that's how we worked on songs. It was all kind of, that's how it is. That's well, it had been a while, it's because a, the last thing you did was return to Memphis of December of 2013, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, was that what it was? That's what my notes say, 2013, December. There it was. Okay. You know, I thought people said it was 10 years, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I can't remember. I remember going to Memphis to do that record. Uh, it didn't turn out the way I wanted, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about the new record, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. the, you know, the thing with, with Mark is he really wants your record to be successful. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he wants it to be more than and a good record you know he wants he wants everybody in the world to like it if possible yeah right? and so that's that's where he comes on and puts his uh, he puts his he puts his pieces in there uh, to make the thing work uh, to make the songs more accessible and uh, my god he's good at it you know well you, well, you got I, you got two brothers from the Hudson's and they're yeah. both pushing it well, look, and let me ask you, I, I mean, because it's kind of a different, and maybe you're used to this, uh, but in my mind, it's kind of different if you have a band like, you know, like Badfinger, who was used to playing together to go into the recording studio because they have a certain camaraderie. What was it like when you, you guys are bringing in different musicians who are all great musicians, but the first time in the studio, I mean, you guys hadn't rehearsed together. You, you didn't have a camaraderie. You didn't work together for decades. What was it like kind of meeting with all these various musicians to lay down the tracks? It was just like you said. <laughs> it was, it, it, you know, but, you know, you meet musicians all your life. Uh, and most of the musicians are pretty much the same, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I read, you know, there are things about being a musician that, that just are, it seems. Um, these guys, the guys that Mark brought, Mark brought the musicians, remember? Right. They weren't uh, egomaniacs, uh, although they were great players. Uh, a lot of them, most of them, in fact, were all Badfinger fans as well. Yeah. Uh, they liked the old Badfinger stuff. Badfinger has a kind of a little bit of a reputation among amongst the bands even young bands today um, you know consider the band something special uh, the, and, and they expect the kind of songs uh, and they know, my, they know my old songs so uh, those guys kind of put the jacket on you know put the suit on and became like bad finger guys or something <laughs> they did, you know they learned the song with you they, they, uh, they played the guitar part that they thought would work mm -hmm. you know uh, it wasn't me going play it like this or play it like that. The song, I, all I would say was the, the song goes like this, right. you know. Uh, and I'd play my little bit, and uh, they join in, and, and surely but surely, two or three times, four times through the song, you know, the bass player's got his part together. The pianist has got the chords where he can block it out easy, you know. And all the basic tracks—that's exactly what they are. They're basic rhythm bends. Mm 
right. you know? Right. Uh, to watch uh, uh, Steve Holly working his drum parts out, man, and talking over the Phil's remark, and then making notes, writing his sheets out, and then he'd go out there and set the groove and just play it. Play it all the way through, play the fills in it, play it right, stop, stop when he's supposed to, accent, you know, whatever. Uh, like he knew the song on the first take and all the rest of the, of the rest of the playing, it was going and looking at his chart and seeing what notes he'd made. Well, I, I got and a feeling that, that Mickey Dolenz was always cutting up, or is that just me because he's a monkey? <laughs> yeah, you think he's going to be like that, but not when he's working. Oh, there uh, you go. He, he's learning the part. Uh, he's pitching it. Uh, he's, he's seeing how high he can go with this part, mm-hmm. you know, with the harmonies. Because he can sing tremendously high. Yeah. Uh, and, and he can sing really strongly. He can sing soft. You know, he's been singing for 50 years, for crying out loud. Yeah. So, uh, he's a real singer, got a real voice. And uh, same with Jason Sheff. Just extraordinary. Uh, listen to the harmonies on the just on the end of uh, Rainy Day Man, uh, and you hear him climbing the harmonies. It, it's stunning how good they got things. Uh, and Jace, uh, I mean uh, uh, Julian, of course. Uh, you think he sounds like his dad? I think he does. Yeah, I think he's got a bit of it there. Yeah. Well, you know, you I know, gotta ask you. He, he, he's definitely aggressive, like his dad. There's a beautiful tenderness uh, that his father had that he had some of. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, there's a, John Lennon had an extraordinary push, my goodness. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, really, really something. Uh, but Julian, watching him work, learning the song, learning the lyrics, learning the harmony, learning the phrasing, and then singing it. With his arms full out and, mm. and singing it, you know, yeah, not not standing there like he's got a suit on and he's, you know, he's not, you know, he's not going to let it out. He's letting it out. Emotional. He's getting it's, involved. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like a hundred percent fantastic. You know, and see, I've got photos. I've got photos of all that stuff. Yeah, he's really cool. Uh, I I don't talk to him about his dad or uh, I talk to him about other things, great shirts or something like that. You know, <laughs> do you like this number? Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody in the world wants to talk about his dad, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if he, wants, if he wants to talk to me about his dad, great. <laughs> well, I know, imagine nah, it's, okay, it's yeah. with him the same way it is with you that, that, you know, and I try to talk about both, but a lot of interviewers will just want to pigeonhole you into talking about Badfinger. You want to talk about you now, too. And, and probably everybody just throws up the Beatles to him all the time, you know? Well, yeah, you know, and I don't blame them. There aren't that many people who worked around the Beatles like I did. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I, I don't know why the hell it was me, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's just what happened. It, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Well, you know, you know you've got all this this history, and I've got to ask you because you know you put out the record, and you want to appease the Bad Finger fans. You want to definitely appease people that are fans of your solo work. Uh, be true to yourself, uh, which is the name of the album, and also a song. That's got to have a meaning. What does that mean about be true to yourself? Is that something special for you, or? Well, it is. Uh, the song became something special for me, and it is something there. Uh, I had that. Sh- I had that melody. For many many years, and then a um, bit of a story. This uh, I happened to be sitting with my eldest brother Frank, and uh, he's way older than me. Like maybe I don't know, eighteen, twenty years older than me. Mm. Uh, and uh, I've never really talked with him in all his life. Never really had a conversation with him. Uh, we got on okay. How you doing, John? Doing okay. How you doing, Frank? You know things like that and I always went to see him when I went to win him but this one night we sat at the kitchen table in his house and had a couple of beers and we started we talked about we got we had a conversation my god and uh, we talked about everything really anything and everything we, we thought of that night and uh, the next day uh, I wrote out the words to the song mm. uh, yesterday we talked about the future uh, can we make it better? Can we make it whole? Uh, you know, who can say? We remember that the, the, the preachers and teachers we had, and we remember the schools that we've been to. 
uh, the, the neighborhoods we grew up in. We talk about all of that. That's great. Um, and, the, and and so the words of the song came. So, uh, and then Mark came up with uh, the chorus, Be True to Yourself. Uh, and it just worked. Right. The whole, you know, just the whole song came together then. And that's what happened. And then we did the psychedelia on the end. And uh, have a bunch a good little song let's call the album that there you go well I know it's it's kind of like picking your favorite child but the the album Be True to Yourself is 10 songs if you had to pick which one is your favorite one Joey what would be your answer Ooh. I know wow wow um, well it's really difficult man it's really difficult well there's, you know there's Be like, True to Your Be True to Yourself of course I and uh a song I always like to I always like to hear is uh, if all I do is cry. Right. Um, I just enjoy that tune. Uh, Great name. But I like I like a lot of them. I like uh, this time. Um, although it's a bit different when when I wrote it to how it ended up. It's very similar to what I wrote, but uh, it's not completely what I wrote. So that's a little. I just liked the this time part. Rainy yeah. Day Man is a great, great song too. Rainy Rainy Day Man came together great, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, Gary Bear sent us the idea. We sat in Mark's apartment, and uh, wow, knocked us out, man. He mm -hmm. sent us the, I think, the first verse and uh, some of the chorus uh, or the bridge. Um, just a fabulous little song, and, and uh, Mark and I settled it all up. Uh, just worked it all out really quick. The bridge came really quick. Uh, just a knockout. And then I think we did a good record of it, don't you? Yeah. No, and, and, and nice. uh, one of my favorites yeah. is Shine. I like Shine. That's a great song, too. It's it's Shine, I wrote. I had the idea, and I wrote in uh, 19, oh, I don't know, 1971, 1972. And we actually demoed it uh, as Badfinger. Mm. We made a demo of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we couldn't make the turn around in it, really, with the Badfinger band for some reason. We couldn't grab the turnaround, so we ended up not really doing it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I like Shine, too. Well, I don't know, do. like, how you're talking to me, whether you're on a phone and your your hands are tied up or whatever. We had talked about the possibility of you playing a guitar and singing something, but then you had the dental surgery. So are, are you able to sing something from the CD or not? And if you can, it's fine. Um, I don't know if I can't sing something from the and I can do a... Uh, can you hear that? I can hear yeah, that, yeah. You can hear it. It's a really nice old harmony guitar. Run, run, Rudolph! Santa's got to make it to town! If you in a hurry, tell him he can take the freeway down. And away went Rudolph! Where's the lucky like man to go around? Six and a two little boy, what is it you long to get? So we couldn't remember, but he wanted to save the jet. Yeah, and away went Rudolph. So Merry Christmas, man. Run, run, Rudolph. Santa's got to make it to town. If he's in a hurry, tell him he can take the freeway down. The way he went, boot up, listen like a man to go round. Very good, and and considering this is our Christmas show, <laughs> that's perfect. perfect. And and to Chuck Berry up there in in heaven, hail hail rock and roll, that's man! Right. Seriously, hail hail rock and roll is right. That's right. All right. Well, we encourage. Uh, I want to thank you, Joey, for joining us. We encourage all of our listeners get this album, check it out. It's amazing. It's called "Be True to Yourself." Obviously, Joey Mullen co uh, produced and co-written with uh, Mark Hudson. No, we should so ask too. Is it, it is it just is it just like a download, or is there a physical CD as well? Yeah, you can get a physical CD, yeah. 
Good. Yeah, but it, but it's definitely available for download. Yeah. Yeah, it's available all over for download. iTunes, uh, Amazon Music, everywhere that you can buy uh, digital CDs. Uh, if you guys want to check out a couple of samplings of the tracks, other than the ones that we've we've sampled with you guys on tonight's show, you can head over to Joey's website, which is badfingersite dot com. Um, and Say that again, because badfingersite. S-I-T-E, like a website, badfingersite.com, and uh, definitely get the album. It would make a great Christmas gift for anybody you know who actually likes good music. So, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, yeah, it is. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Joey, I want to thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us uh, tonight and, and for singing. Tonight is technically our Christmas show because this is the last show we do before Christmas. So, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your weekend and a uh, very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And you both, both of you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.